we will listen to the uh, second keynote speech uh, from uh, Jan Nederman Petersen from University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, actually, you can find his uh, biography on the uh, again on page 469 of your program. I'm not going to repeat that again. Well, actually, the uh, Professor Kim very succinctly uh, summarized how the uh, Asian development, Asian capitalism, capitalism was formed. And well, actually, I read the uh, Jan's paper, and the, uh, he is a kind of in continuation with his explanation. So uh, let me the, uh, listen to his uh, interesting uh, presentation for 40 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Distinguished colleagues, old friends, it's a pleasure to see you again. New friends, compliments to the organizer. This is always so well organized with a big book already before we start. Also, uh, Professor Wang, uh, I must totally agree with you. Soul in the autumn is really beautiful. Um, now, uh, colleagues, I'm not a morning person. Uh, I, my plan is in the course of the day I will actually wake up. But for now, I will uh, do a presentation. I must confess, I do not catch the meaning of the title Capitalism and Capitalisms of the conference. I hope to learn what it means at any rate. I have been assigned a subject um, comparing capitalism East and West, and I will simply do it. Now, the usual arguments here that there are several families of capitalism, major families, Nordic capitalism, Anglo-American, uh, East Asian developmental states, uh, China, many other variations, and tools, uh, instruments of analysis are varieties of capitalism, comparative capitalism approaches, thick business studies, and the classic categories we know are uh, the liberal market economies, coordinated market economies, and state-led market economies. This, by the way, is a little overview of the discussion. Some of the headings of the slides will will walk through this as we go along. Now, liberal market economies we typically find in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, the UK. Coordinated market economies, very broadly in many regions, West and East. State-led market economies, well, Singapore, China, Vietnam, Laos, North Korea, Russia, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, uh, probably one or two more. At the same time, they are all, of course, mixed economies. Now, if we follow Polanyi and many others, markets, of course, are embedded in society. And by the way, as I think about this, I think this is probably the most important slide in this presentation. Immigrant societies, settler immigrant societies, highly individualized, are liberal market economies typically. Post-feudal societies, pardon the, uh, the shorthand, there's a longer story there, are typically coordinated or state-led market economies. Post-revolutionary societies, societies after war, after crisis, are state-led. Now, within each, there is also a time series that we can apply. There's regional differentiation and time differentiation. So in the United States, of course, after crisis, a new deal. After the war, Keynesianism, and also Fordism was a major episode. Let's unbundle the West. 
Europe is profoundly different from the United States. Mediterranean Europe is profoundly different from Nordic Europe, as we have just noticed with the Greek crisis. And then within the categories, there is further regional differentiation. For instance, the American South, the land of Dixie, the slaveholding confederacy in the past is very different from the Northeast, now also called the Rust Belt, etc. Then let's unbundle the East. Northeast Asia is quite different from Southeast Asia. In fact, now for a year I am in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia to direct a research project on comparing Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, partly on the premise that Mahathir in the early 80s initiated the policy of looking east, which meant look at Japan, then meant look at Korea, and this research project is about looking at when we look north to Northeast Asia in 2015, what do we find? Um, China has elements arguably about no both Northeast Asia and Southeast uh, uh, Asia. We find in China multiple capitalisms, state-owned enterprises, um, small and medium enterprises, the local co corporates, and foreign direct investment cooperating with, with all of them. Now, Northeast Asia is very different in its organization from the United States. In fact, arguably, Northeast Asia in remarkable ways matches Nordic Europe. The Gini coefficients um, I find it a bit difficult to put tables and figures in PowerPoint, so I didn't do it. You know, it's a bit of work, so to speak. At any rate, let me assure you, you look at the Gini coefficients of Scandinavia and Nordic Europe, and they are between 0.25 and 0.30. You look at the Gini coefficients of Northeast Asia, include Japan, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and the Gini coefficients are 0 0.30, 0 0.31 in that neighborhood. This is very striking. Um, per capita incomes uh, are comparable. Urbanization rates are very high. Also striking is the salient prominent role of, of the state, of labor unions, and generally a matrix of coordinated market economies that mm, follow models of Japan, and Japan in turn historically followed models of Germany. Another achievement of Northeast Asia, so Northeast Asia has industrialized with internationally competitive um, industries, and has done so with low Gini coefficients in a relatively egalitarian way, and it has consolidated its democracies. And we could also describe these societies as post-feudal, high social cohesion, a social market approach, similar to Europe. Now, before continuing in some specifics, may I suggest, even though it is early in the morning, that we take a step back and ask the question, why is it that in the debate on capitalism, we are mesmerized by the singular? Even in the title of this conference, it was not sufficient to say capitalisms, we must also say capitalism. Why do we do this? So, remember Borges. The map is not the same as the territory, because otherwise the map would be very large. Now, in relation to culture, it's very easy. I think it's very easy. I think 
for, for all of us, most of us, very easy. Yes, there is transnational culture. There's a global cultural supermarket with confetti of all sorts of components. That is Hollywood, Walt Disney, CNN, McDonald's, even McDonaldization, Barbie, and so forth. And we all recognize there is Bollywood, there is Hallyu, there is Japanese design, there are Turkish soap operas, um, Brazilian sambo, flamenco, tango, and so on and so forth. And West African high life, it's all there. And within these, there are micro-regional variations. That is, you have Bollywood, but you also have the Tamil Nadu film industry and so forth. And Brazil in the Northeast is very different from Brazil in the South, and so on. And then within these, within the micro-regional variations, we have subcultures. So that, for instance, in Seoul, Gangnam is very different from Dong Dae Moon. Uh, <coughs> and then across all of these, at all the levels, there is ongoing change hybrids, bricolage, because everybody is learning um, from many different sources. I think for all of us, is it's easy to recognize this. It's easy to hold many balls in the air and to juggle them. And why is it easy? Why, does it, is, why is it ordinary and come as routine? For one thing, because in relation there are no overriding, compelling, driving, powerful narratives. Or those that did exist, say the romantic views of Herder or Carlyle, 19th century, ideas of race, orientalism, civilizational views, a la Toynbee or later Huntington, they have all more or less faded. Compare capitalism. In relation to capitalism, we do have two major variables. Powerful narratives and powerful drives. The narratives, 19th century theory, 20th century, 21st century, Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st century. Among the drives, Technological change, um, information communication technology, Silicon Valley, but of course we know that the tech change is multicentric. It doesn't just come from one source. Um, <clears throat> financialization is multicentric as well. There is Wall Street, London, Frankfurt, and so forth, but there are also the sovereign wealth funds. Norway, the Emirates, and so on and so forth, generating new financial corridors and principles of organization. Then, of course, there is the hegemonic pressure that we all know, the Wall Street Treasury IMF complex, the Washington consensus, now no longer a consensus, but metamorphosed to WTO and now TPP, TIPP, etc. And plenty of agencies, uh, McKinsey, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper. I'm in Malaysia, and Malaysia just published its 11th Malaysia Plan. It's a big book, a very well produced vis uh, visuals. It has been written by McKinsey. Because of these powerful narratives and drives, we have very salient, very prominent, and dominates in several literatures, the ideas of convergence. Um, and part of this is the idea of global capitalism, global plutocracy, transnational capitalist class, which sometimes I refer to as the leap to the global, global culture global modernity, global crisis, global financial crisis, global economics, global brands, global, global everything. With the idea of neoliberalism everywhere. Um, and Davo, man, and, and, and so forth. 
and more nuanced ideas like variegated neoliberalization. But here's the odd thing. An immigrant settler society, the United States, is an anomaly historically. There aren't many societies like that. An outlier, an anomaly sets, claims to set the standards of what capitalism is. Why is it able to do so? Because of hegemony and its rise to hegemony that overlapped and coincided with technological transformations, with financialization, etc., etc. Nevertheless, all along, the capitalism discussion is a shorthand discussion. We are always talking about the dominant form of capitalism, which then other forms of capitalism are supposed to converge on. Varieties of capitalism thesis concerns national varieties, United States, Germany, Japan, and so forth, which makes sense because nations, varieties of capitalism is about regulatory institutions, nations are the locus of regulatory institutions. But of course, there are also varieties of capitalism within nations. Northern Italy, uh, Southern Italy, Mezzogiorno, uh, United States, Northeast, Southeast, etc., etc. Given methodological nationalism, such variations simply rarely come up. That Catalonia is different from Castilia and Andalusia is different again and so forth. Um, and if we then make the step from methodological nationalism to methodological globalism, uh, the narratives don't really get much better. Convergence. Well, let's, let us test then the idea of convergence in, we take East Asia. Can Southeast Asia is it converging upon Northeast uh, Asia? Can tiger cubs become tigers? And the work which we are now doing in Malaysia, and in cooperation with other colleagues, is the general theme is East Asia mind the gap. And the gap is, is dramatically large because the three achievements of Northeast Asia mentioned, mentioned earlier, Southeast Asia has been missing out on all these achievements. And you may simply be aware. Think of Southeast Asia. Can you think of one internationally competitive industrial brand? You cannot. Um, Gini co co coefficients are 10 points higher, around the 40s. Uh, democracies consolidating, I think we should better change the subject. <clears throat> Two countries in Southeast Asia approximated the Northeast Asian um, project closest. And there were Indonesia with aircraft and automobile manufacturing and Malaysia with automobile man man manufacturing, the proton car project of Mahathir. Read the quote, 5 October, Proton had a market share in Malaysia of 60% in, say, 2002. Its market share is now 17%. And it's Competitor, uh, uh, a combined Japanese co com company, company um, has 31 per a percent. A general principle. Perception follows resolution. We have low resolution approaches, coarse grain in a lot of sociology, 
with cat lumping categories like capitalism and modernity, world system theory, transnational capitalist class. These analytics are valid, they are useful, but they're a bit abstract. They're coarse grain. Wolfgang Streeck, with his category of OECD capitalism, uh, that, that combines the Atlantic and the Pacific in a nice sweep, it has a validity, but it's coarse grain. High resolution pictures have proven to be much more insightful, persuasive, um, instructive in anthropology, in thick business studies, and in some forms of uh, geography where people work on the, on the interactions between the local and the global. Um, another dimension we can take into account, uh, Professor Kim, you were referring to it, uh, selective learning. Um, if we make the difference from being hybridized, undergoing hybridization influences to hybridizing, exercising agency in hybridization processes so that borrowing becomes willed, selective, let's say in Asia, from Meiji, Japan on onwards, you were referring to it, um, this has been a pattern um, in Asia. And in relation to markets, this implies a partial and an instrumental embrace of markets. Markets, we will encourage them as long as they contribute to various di dimensions, which is the general approach in uh, East Asian developmental states. It is the general approach in uh, emerging market developing countries. It is a very different approach to markets than the market fundamentalism, faith in markets, efficient market theory, and so on and so forth, of the Chicago School and in Anglo-American cap capitalism. <laughs> there is a narrative that goes with this picture, um, but I've forgotten what the narrative is. <laughs> Um, Wolf Schaefer, you were referring to it last night. The idea in convergent thinking, in coarse grain thinking, is that learning drives convergence. Learning is from the leading, most dynamic, etc., or dominant form of capitalism. And of course, that is not true. Um, State-led market, state market economies learn from other state-led market economies. And here is a quote, um, also October. Um, China, in looking to reform its zombie firm, state-owned enterprises privatizing them, wants to avoid mistakes of Russia. Here is another learning process. Looks to Singapore, to, to Tamastak Holdings. And... Um, then you can place next to this many other forms of learning. Let's just take the sovereign wealth funds. Um, Abu Dhabi Investment Corporation uh, is learning from the Norwegian sovereign wealth funds, etc., etc. Uh, in other words, this, this idea of financialization, Wall Street leads, etc., etc., is uh, it's a very partial account. Uh, rounding off this discussion, and I have started, I have done about, I'm close to 25 minutes. Sorry, what? Yeah, good. And I will do that by reading this very slowly. <laughs> Look, uh, rounding off now, and then please let us have a conversation and, and, uh, and a wider dialogue. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about this, why does it matter? For what reason is this important? 
I think one empirically, it is the diversity of capitalisms that keeps capitalism going. Think of global value chains. They exist, and the splicing up of production com com components works, is meaningful because it relates to economies at, at different levels and with different organization systems. <laughs> On the part of corporations, there is institutional arbitrage. Um, Mexico has these forms of labor organization. Um, Colombia has these forms of environmental pro protection, etc. And there is a balancing taking, taking uh, place. Another noteworthy point is the dramatic wide diversity in patterns of inequality. Mentioned earlier, Nordic Europe, Gini co co coefficient, 0 0.25, 0 0.30. You look at the United States, it's up in the, in the 40s. Um, Northeast Asia matches Nordic Europe, which is one of the reasons, not just people's ad admiration for Samsung products, but it's one of the reasons why people look up to Northeast Asia as another torch bearer of an alternative and more social form of capitalism. And we would wish that Southeast Asia could match this. It has been trying for, for 30 years. It, it's not really happening. Um, then we think of social struggles if capitalism is all the same, if our premise all along is, it is convergence, 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 then why would all the social struggles matter? So I think it is in light of these considerations that it is important for us to look at capitalisms in the plural, worldwide, in East Asia, and in the West as well. Um, and on that note, I want to thank you um, with a blessing, namaste, greeting from a dear child in Nepal.